water is an issue that can unite people. It uh, turns out water is life. Their slogans were always very powerfully pro-water, very positive goal, less anti-mining. And through that and their boldness in reaching out to unlikely allies, they were able to gather quite a force. Welcome to Empathy Media Lab's Book Talks, where we explore ideas that shape our world. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer of Empathy Media Lab, which publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture, and we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Robin Broad and John Cavanaugh about their book, The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed. It tells of the harrowing and inspiring saga of El Salvador's fight and historic victory to save their water and their communities from big gold. Dr. Robin Broad is a professor at American University with research interests centering on the political economy of development. Dr. Broad has served as an international economist in the U.S. Treasury Department, the U.S. Congress, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And John Cavanaugh was director of the Institute for Policy Studies from 1999 to 2021 and is now a senior advisor at IPS. John sits on the boards of the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center and the International Forum on Globalization the New Orleans Workers' Center for Racial Justice and the National Guest Worker Alliance, and he's senior advisor of the Poor People's Campaign. And I could go on and on. You have a very illustrious CV, and uh, that is just a short uh, snapshot. But thank you so much for your time. Great to be with you. Thank you, Evan. It's an honor to be on your show. So I want to begin just with the, the main question. Why did you want to write this book? So I'll start, and then... John might jump in, but, or probably will jump in. We wanted to write this book in, in, in good part because even though there are parts of it that are harrowing and incredibly sad, it is ultimately a story of hope. It is a story of two of the most unlikely and inspiring victories that we've ever witnessed and had the, had the privilege to be a part of. The fact that these victories happened in a poorer country, in struggles that were led by ordinary but extraordinary people, poorer people, made it all the more important to retell because if you can have these kinds of victories against, against rich institutions, corporations from richer countries, if El Salvador and poorer people in El Salvador can lead movements that bring those victories and especially environmental and social victories, then it should be possible anywhere. If, El, if yeah. poorer people in El Salvador can do it, then certainly we in the U.S. and in other countries should be able to take hope from them and be convinced that victories are possible, even if at the beginning it seems impossible. Yeah, and maybe just to add one other point. El Salvador is a country like the United States that is politically extremely divided. And this fight for to save the rivers of El Salvador against big corporations, the people who were involved in it, the movements that were involved in it, realized that they couldn't win it if just the usual progressive forces came together. They were, they were greatly overshadowed in the Congress by conservative forces. And so they knew from the start they could only win if they could win over some unusual allies. And for us, Robin and I are involved in these fights all the time in the United States and elsewhere. And we now face those very hard to win with just the usual group of, of allies. And so we thought there were tremendous lessons from this for the United States and for people in other countries. And I do want to focus on what were some of the tactics and strategies that you lay out in the book on how to organize against such things. But before that, let's go a little bit into El Salvador. And who was Marcelo Rivera, who is a central character that you introduced at the beginning? So let, let me actually turn that around a little and, start, and, and tell you how we became involved in this. And Please. that... That will be a way to introduce Marcelo. So because really in, in, in many, it was serendipity. I mean, this is, John and I are not experts on Latin America. We obviously know a lot about U.S. involvement in Latin America. Any person of our age who is at all woke has to, has to know that. But there was no reason for us 
really to to know of of what was going on with the water defenders in, in El Salvador, and never mind to know of Marcelo Rivera. So in some sense, it was serendipity. John's organization, the Institute for Policy Studies, every year selects uh, a group from El Salvador and a group from the United States to, we, to win at their annual Human Rights Award. In 2009, they selected a network of Salvadoran water defenders called La Mesa to get that award. The, the award was to honor La Mesa's work, its struggle to try and keep global mining companies out of El Salvador. Five water defenders were to come to Washington, D.C. to accept that award in October 2009. But three months before October 2009, we received the shocking news that one of the leaders of La Mesa, a teacher and a cultural worker named Marcelo Rivera had gone missing. First, he went missing for, for two weeks. He was disappeared. And then after about two weeks, his brutally tortured body was found in the bottom of a 30-foot well. Actually, I'm getting goosebumps now as I'm telling the story. And in 2009, we were even more horrified. Mar Marcelo's younger brother, Miguel, came to Washington in, in Marcelo's place to accept the award. And after the award ceremony, Miguel very respectfully asked to talk to us. And he asked for our help. The key mining company that was trying to get a license to, to mine in northern El Salvador, in the area near Miguel and Marcelo's hometown, had, had launched a legal case a very, this is a very, this is a legal case pe most people don't know about, but had launched a legal case against the government of El Salvador in a, what was then rather a secretive tribunal in the World Bank Group in Washington, D.C. The water defenders knew very little about this venue, and they could not figure out how it was that the fate of their, their country, their hometown was going to be decided by three tribunalists, three arbitration judges in a court in Washington, D.C. that they could not even testify before. And so we were not experts on this court, but we knew a lot about the World Bank and those institutions. And so we did what I think anyone in our position did, would do, is we offered to do a little research. Of course, we're happy to do a bit of research and us thinking it would be a day or two. And how could you say no to Miguel, whose brother Marcelo had just been murdered? So that conversation in October 2009 turned into a decade of some of the most rewarding work of our lives. And before we go into the World Bank too, you, you highlight one of the antagonists who is this guy, Tom Schrake, who's president Pacific Rim Mining Corporation. John, could you talk about who this guy was and, and why you want to bring him into the book? Sure. Well, when, um, Mining companies are a, a fascinating group of companies, and they have a structure whereby there's a set of junior mining companies that go around the world looking for gold and silver and copper and lithium and manganese and so on. And then big mine, once they find it, they sell the stake to a big mining company. A lot of the heads of these smaller companies are engineers. They know how to sniff out gold and silver. And so... When mineral prices were going up at the beginning of this century, partly because people were buying more cell phones and computers and China was buying more minerals, these mining companies started to spread around the world to look for places. Some of them that, that had had gold mining in this case back in the 1950s, but with prices not going up, they'd abandoned the mines. Prices started shooting up. Mining became very lucrative, and these mining companies spread around the world. Tom Schrake was the head of one, Pacific Rim. They came into El Salvador in 2002, 2003, bought up another mining company that had had a mine there in, in the 1950s, and he smelled big gold. It's interesting, these people, because they, they truly, they use all their senses. He knew that it had been a lucrative mine 50 years uh, before. But he also, what they do, and this El Salvador let them do this, and most countries do, is get a license to explore. They dug some holes. They did find rich veins of gold. 
And so Tom Schrake becomes the guy who is obsessed with getting a permit to mine in El Salvador and make a huge amount of money for himself and for a bigger mining company that he would sell the concession to once it was given to him. Yeah, that was interesting presentation of that business model is that you go in there and you try to make as much money as possible with as least regulatory financial burden as possible. And then you, you sell it to the larger corporations and cash out and then start, start smaller mine that you can then kind of recycle this process. Yeah. You can tell lawyers, you know, and not all lawyers are bad, but you can tell lawyers really thought this through because one of the things that we learned as we got deeper into this is mining in most cases. And anybody who lives in Pennsylvania or other Nevada in the United States know this. Once mining companies come and they mine and they take out what's there and they leave, they leave devastation, devastation that would cost often hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up. So you want a legal model that allows the companies to get out quickly and try to avoid any of the financial, the horrible financial costs that they, that they leave behind. And this is, and, and Tom Schrake is part of, is part of that model. It's a model, by the way, which the more we heard about it and learned about it, it's outrageous. It should be banned. And a lot of people who are working on mining now are working on ways to force corporations up front to put money aside so that when the inevitable environmental devastation happens, there is money for cleanup. The other thing just to add is, as John said, so there are what are called junior companies who come and explore, and then there are more senior companies who actually mine the gold. But those aren't, those aren't just separate entities. There's usually one, two, three. There are some board members who are on both of them. So it's a, it's a larger family of interlocking corporations who just for those legal purposes are separate. So, and it's not that that's, it's the, the way mining companies do it is unique to mining companies, but it's also not unique. It's the way global corporations work. And so we're in one of the major capitals where a lot of global corporations make deals and you have this great presentation of this activism that you did around the World Bank. And there was a meeting going on with the ICSID, which was created by the World Bank in 1964 Tokyo World Bank meeting. And I have quite an in-depth experience in international development, USAID, and I'm, I've worked with the World Bank, but I've never heard of this, this committee, this office, and I had to do a little research. Could you talk about this office to the audience? Sure. Well, corporations have as corporations went global in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, they created institutions and rules around the world to protect their profits over community rights. And one of them was a place. Remember 1960s, certain countries, governments were elected that were anti-corporate and in some countries expropriated mines, took them over. So corporations wanted a place where they could rig the rules in their favor and in as 1964, as part of the World Bank Group, they created this International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. They, they set it up. It is the wild west of, of rules in the sense that they're rigged in favor of the corporations. Corporations can sue governments. Governments can't sue corporations. They can sue for foregone profits. So that's what we'll get into in a moment in this case. But it's a big institution. It's right in the middle of Washington, D.C., and just to say, I mean, one scene that I think Robin and I particularly liked writing about in the book was once after that scene that Robin described where, where water defenders asked us for help, they said, by the way, they've got El Salvador covered. They'll fight the mining company there, but they would like more information both on the mining company and on this tribunal. And so we went to work, we did a ton of research, but we also decided to add a bit of theater. And we built a coalition called International Allies, the Institute for Policy Studies, other groups like Mining Watch Canada. It had labor unions, environmental groups, women's groups, solidarity groups, development groups, and so on. And we 
learned when the tribunal would be meeting and we plan protests outside. Some of your listeners will know the Teamsters have an amazing inflatable fat cat. <laughs> Sorry to the people who are listening who love cats because, you know, we've appropriated that term fat cats. And so we had a giant fat cat out in front of the World Bank with the sign Pacific Rim on it and made a great deal of noise and had this incredible coalition putting pressure on them, on an institution, which as you said, Evan and Robin said at the beginning, most of us who even work on international economic things knew very, very little about. So we've exposed it. One thing about this story in this case is, is this institution has been exposed and all of its injustices. And uh, you bring in an incredible coalition, and that's a big kind of takeaway, is that you need not just this single focus, but you brought in environmentalists, you brought in labor, and then you brought in the El Salvadorian component of the people most affected by this particular project. And it climaxes to the point where this mediation takes place, and they favor on the side of El Salvador. And... My concern, though, it's it's still just, what, three people in this World Bank group that's making these decisions for millions of people? What what was kind of your takeaway and, and what are your thoughts going forward to deal with such so much power and entrenched in just a few hands? Well, first of all, it's important. We never say in the book that El Salvador won because yes, countries don't win in this court. Governments don't win. The, if they're lucky, the corporation loses. And that's not often the case, but in this case, the, the reason it's, it's key, and this again is something that, that a lot of what we learned and the voices we channel are what the people on in the ground in El Salvador taught us, but, but their government, when, again, Marcelo was killed, three other people were killed. Their government spent seven years and over probably $13 million fighting this case, because when you're sued in ICSID, you actually have to pay for your own lawyers. You have to pay fees for ICSID. Um, and so even though in the end, the corporation lost, the government also lost. It spent more money and, and, and lost a lot of, and wasted a lot of time. And that's, that's part of the way this this, you were, we were talking before about how legal things are set up. This venue, which isn't officially a court, it's an arbitration venue. This is set up so the governments will not, will give up. So most of the cases, this for El Salvador, for Pacrim versus El Salvador, it took seven years. Most of the cases don't even reach an end because most of the governments are, are so convinced that they're going to lose that they settle somewhere along the way. They either, in some cases, they settle and let the corporations mulling and, or do whatever else they wanted to do against some new, some environmental or social rule that a government put in place, or, or else the governments agree to pay them some kind of money. So when the corporations begin the ICSID lawsuits, they ask for a ridiculous amount of money. It's a, it's a game. It's, I mean, to them, it's a game. They actually call it. The, uh, this this guy who you mentioned, Tom Shrake, he calls it high stakes poker. So so they ask for an amount of money that include that is not just compensation for investment they they put for invest for it's not just expropriation paying them for any factories that were expropriated. In this case, nothing was expropriated, but like they ask for money for profits foregone, which is a, you think about it is a very odd concept. So if you're watching the price of gold, if you're a corporation, you're going to pick the highest price you can think of and the most profit, the highest profit stream, and you're going to put, increase that by 10 times. And you're going to ask for that amount of money, hoping that somewhere along the way, the government will settle. And what's part of what's incredible about this story is that this true story is that the government of Salvador, both when it was ruled by conservative right-wing parties and when it was ruled by better, more progressive parties, they didn't give in to that pressure. They, they held firm. And it, it's, so it is an a, a amazing story, but it is absolutely, it's not a story about how ICSID is a good guy, is a good institution. It's a story about one case where a coalition of groups in El Salvador 
and an allied coalition of groups outside of El Salvador worked together for years to make it happen. And it also culminated with El Salvador passing a law. Could you talk about that law? Sure. And just one more point on the, the lawsuit. The goal, you said, what's the goal going forward? For all of us involved in this and in other cases like this, our goal is to abolish this institution and completely change the rules. And we've been pressing governments not to include these rules in their future trade and investment agreements. And some have done that. The new U.S.-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement prohibits lawsuits between the U.S. and Canada going forward. It still allows them against Mexico. So there's a kind of neo-colonial stage we're in now where the rich countries are saying, okay, we don't need this anymore, but let's still use it with the poor countries. Our goal is to get rid of it completely. So the other victory, which was even more improbable than the victory you've just heard about, is that, okay, October 2016, the tribunal rules um, against the company. And the water defenders on the ground in El Salvador with their own big coalition, as Robin laid out, they sit back and say, okay, we always wanted to win this particular case and get rid of this company, but our bigger goal was to end mining overall in El Salvador. They had looked at El Salvador. It, 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 they weren't saying there should be no mining anywhere in the world. They were saying El Salvador is a small country, one big river going through the country. The mine sites are around the watershed that feeds over half of the people in the country. So in their view, there should be no mining whatsoever in El Salvador. And so they began to push that once again. This was at a time when the legislature in El Salvador was two thirds conservative parties, pro-business parties. So how did they win? Well, the key thing they did is they said, we're gonna need to win over some, some unusual allies. And they said this throughout the fight. And, and Robin can talk about one or two of them, but I'll say what was fascinating at the beginning is it's a, for anyone who's been to El Salvador or Latin America in general, predominantly Catholic countries, they knew that they needed to get the Catholic church on their side. Many people who know El Salvador know of the great um, archbishop who then became a saint, uh, Oscar Romero. He was killed in 1980 and the Catholic church put in a succession of much more conservative archbishops after that. Rome did that. And so they knew we got a conservative archbishop. He actually belonged to this right wing. It's sort of like a cult of this day. And most of the people in, in La Mesa said, forget about it. We'll never get him. He's pro-business. They, but they said, no, we got to try. So they tried and they pushed and they kept getting blown off. Finally, they got a meeting. They're in the meeting. They're getting nowhere. The guy looks bored. And then they mentioned that you use cyanide to separate the gold from the surrounding rock. All of a sudden he lit up and he said, why didn't you say this before? I have a degree in, in chemistry. We can't have cyanide in our rivers in El Salvador. And he flipped and he brought the church with him. And it was a great example. Then through churches in El Salvador, people were taught the, the horrors of mining and of cyanide and of the, the poison that it would bring. And so in a series of bold moves, and imagine this in the United States, somebody says, okay, we're going to reach out to Mitch McConnell. And half, you know, three quarters of the people in the room say, are you kidding? And they did that several times. And there's something about water. I mean, water is an issue that can unite people. It uh, turns out water is life. Their slogans were always very powerfully pro-water, very positive goal, less anti-mining. And through that and their boldness in reaching out to unlikely allies, they were able to gather quite a force. I don't know, Robin, if there's anyone else you want to mention in that category. Well, be before I do that, let me just say for just a, a tiny bit about, about the environmental costs of, what, of mining, because we've, we've talked about it, but, but not specifically in terms of why the water defenders did not want mining in their area. And John just talked about it in terms of that, that one big watershed. So it is, no matter what the mining companies tell you, it is impossible to mine in large commercial ways without using toxic chemicals. And the key toxic chemical that mining companies use for gold mining is cyanide. So they use the cyanide to separate the gold from the rock. 
Um, so that's number one, cyanide. Number number two, when when so when the gods with the small g put the gold in the rock, they played a trick on human beings. And in more than half the places in the world, they not only put gold in the rock, they also put arsenic. So when you use cyanide to separate, when these companies use cyanide to separate the rock, in the majority of places in the world, arsenic is also released. So too, does the sulfide in the rock turn into sulfuric acid? I'm almost done. It's a long list, though. <laughs> but, but the, the sulfuric acid then, every time it rains, leaches whatever chemicals are in the rock, which is often iron and other things. So it's a, it's a nightmare of a concatenation of toxic chemicals that then go into the land and the water. So... Those were the, the key concerns of the water defenders in terms of who were mostly small-scale agriculturalists, peasants growing, growing beans and corn. But they very quickly, they, they, I, I, we should also say that this is a poorer area in northern El Salvador. The water defenders, many of them, when they heard that mining was going to, was interested in coming into El Salvador, they were delighted. Their initial reaction was not surprisingly to say, wonderful, we'll get jobs, we'll get richer. And then they started to learn all these realities about mining. And that's, that's something really important about this story. We in richer countries, we, we highly, maybe overly educated people in richer countries, we have, there's a tendency to assume that poorer people in poorer countries either can't care, won't care about the environment or can't understand these things. And in fact, our experience in El Salvador and the Philippines, where we've also spent years, is that they understand it even better than we do because they're living it. Yeah. So they understood it, they gathered the scientific evidence, and that was part of how they convinced these unlikely allies. It wasn't simply joining us and being for water and against gold. It was, this is the environmental reality and therefore the future economic reality for us. And that's how they built the alliances. And with the remaining time that we have left, I love the fact that it's focused on water defenders. It's this positive message instead of saying we're just anti-mining. And I do want to talk a little bit about how you would answer to critics saying, well, everything that we're doing right now in this conversation, when you look at our backgrounds, using the technology, everything depends on mining, and then fabricating and the distribution of that. And in, in a way, we got to figure out how to do it clean. We have to make sure that the labor is protected, that the labor is paid, that there's clean power that goes to all of these things, clean transportation that goes to all these things. And I, I just wonder, and you do talk a bit about the recycling side of things, but how do you respond to people that say, well, we have to have mining, so, so what else can we do? Sure. Well, yes, we still need mining for the world <laughs> that we live in and that we want to live in. That is true. And there's one other tricky factor here, Evan, which is that in the massive transition that we all now know we need from fossil fuels to clean energy, a lot of the technologies around clean energy, particularly batteries for electric cars, actually use more minerals. So there's five or six minerals, nickel, cobalt, manganese, so on, copper that are going to be needed in even greater quantities in to save the planet, if you will. So this will be one of the big issues we would predict of the next decade is how to deal with this contradiction that we're going to need more mining, which is Robin has described as inherently destructive. And we come out of it really with, I'd say, three quick thoughts on that. One, right now in the U.S., we're only recycling about 90 percent, about 30 percent of metals. We have to, if we could get that up to 80 to 90%, we could cut out a lot of mining. So that's the first. The second is, yes, a lot of the minerals that will be needed for the transition are going to go into electric cars. So as long as we remain addicted to cars, it's going to be hard to reduce mining. So we, IPS, and many of our allies are deeply involved in a transit equity coalition that are pushing for massive amounts of money to go into public transit in an equitable way 
which would reduce the dependence on cars. Europe has already done this. We can learn from Europe. So we have to reduce our dependence on cars, which will also reduce our dependence on other metals and minerals. And finally, third, what a lot of our allies in the developing world, where a lot of these minerals are, are telling us is that we really need to respect the wishes of communities. Not all communities will be opposed to mining, but most will, and we've got to work with them. And as mines are closed down, we've got to work with these other solutions of of recycling and shifting away from, from cars to create some kind of balance that's both good for the planet. And as you said, Evan, the key to this throughout will be respect for worker rights and all of these different new industries that are emerging and in the mining sector as well. It's one of the most dangerous and dirty jobs in the world. If you piece all of that together, we can do it well, but it will require a massive education campaign and this will be one of the central issues truly of, of the next decade. Thank you, John. And Robin, any last thoughts? Well, I was going to say, it's, um, really, this is my um, late father was a metallurgical engineer. And John and I were already working with people in El Salvador before he died. And this was, it was fascinating to talk to him about what we needed metals for and what we don't need metals for. So. That's the con kind of conversation that we can have. Okay, my father was maybe a likely ally, but if you think of you think of metal, metallic engineers as being people who look for metals, that's their job. That we have to have these conversations, and and part of what we and other we and others have come out of it with is this idea that there be something called something comparable to a no go zone. So in El Salvador. The people in El Salvador just decided that their whole their whole country, which is a tiny country, was a no-go zone because of the environmental costs there. In other places, and right now this is part of the is part of the debate happening in Chile with the under the new Chilean president, is where in Chile should there could there, could there be mining where shouldn't there be mining? This there's a lot of lithium in Chile. And so it's a combination of giving the people who live on the land, as John said, the right to say no, combined with looking at the, the ecological re realities of the land. But that shouldn't be a hard task. If I mean, it's, it may, it may seem like, it may seem like, oh, there's no way, but there's certainly a way. We're really excited to announce May 31st, the Spanish language edition of the Water Defenders will be released in Mexico City to be, to be spread across Latin America so Water Defenders themselves can read about it. Mm -hmm.